you're giving advice to undergraduates, what what skills should they acquire while they're here as an undergraduate? And then what might they want to think about doing in their path to serving well and effectively in the Foreign Service? Well, um, the type of uh, the Foreign Service doesn't have any specific requirement for an academic degree or background going into the Foreign Service, and that's quite deliberate by nature. The Foreign Service looks for generalists. It looks for people who have uh, skills that uh, make them adaptable, able to be of value instantly in any situation into which they're dropped. The uh, skills that, uh, as I see young entering officers, uh, the skills that some of the outstanding officers have that I see, uh, one probably the leading skill is just the willingness and ability to work very, very hard, to be very, very productive, to use their time well. At the end of every day, there's something to, to be shown for what they've done. Uh, often uh, in foreign service uh, embassy environment, you don't know from one day to the next what you might be asked to do. And the ability to turn around very quickly with a specific assignment, get it done well, get it done on time, uh, that's something that I think uh, senior managers and embassies uh, look for. The ability to write well, to write quickly, to write uh, concisely, uh, that's a skill that if you don't have when you come into the Foreign Service, you need to acquire very, very quickly. And probably the third area that uh, makes officers stand out is their interpersonal skills. Now that may sound sort of touchy-feely, but more often than not when I see officers failing to progress in their career, it's because of the lack of interpersonal skills. It's not that they're unpleasant people, uh, it's just that they sometimes aren't aware of how to use interpersonal skills to work effectively within a team or to understand authority relationships. At the end of the day, the State Department, the Foreign Service, like any large institution, is a bureaucracy. And you have to know how, to, how you fit within that bureaucracy in order to make yourself effective. Sometimes uh, in those three areas, let's say the interpersonal skills, the written communication skills, and then uh, work ethic, strangely enough particularly at embassies overseas, uh, you don't have the luxury of having a lot of people. It's very, very expensive for the U.S. government to send people overseas. And so by uh, plan, uh, most foreign service positions overseas sort of expect that you're on 24-hour uh, uh, call. You don't progress well in the foreign service if you work a nine-to-five uh, day. What other advice would you give, Mr. Ambassador, to students, people who are progressing, who haven't gotten to the Foreign Service yet? You mentioned your path and your education and your training, um, and what s general skills you would advise for, but in your decisions to go certain places before you got to the State Department, what advice would you give about that? Well, it's always a challenge entering the Foreign Service, and uh, the process of admissions, the testing uh, process, changes somewhat from year to year. But it always essentially tries to uh, screen out people who don't have those qualities of a generalist. They look for people who have broad uh, uh, general knowledge, that have uh, good communication skills. Uh, I sometimes tell people who are saying, well, how can I pass the Foreign Service exam to get a subscription to The Economist, read it cover to cover for a year. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, then probably it's not the knowledge that you acquire, but you're committed enough and you understand well enough and you enjoy reading well enough that you probably have done that often in your past and, uh, and will be able to pass the general knowledge background. That's often the, uh, uh, the barrier that many people who take the test uh, uh, trip up on. Uh, after that, once you enter the Foreign Service, it's very difficult in the Foreign Service to sort of set out a plan for how your career is going to go usually during your first two or three assignments, those assignments will be determined by the entry-level uh, office that manages the careers of entry-level officers. And they're largely assessing entry-level officers before tenure to see if they have the ability to work effectively abroad in, in a variety of assignments. Uh, so you just have to be flexible, willing to work hard, uh, and uh, get along well with, uh, with colleagues. I'll add one other thing, of course, at every embassy abroad, the majority of the employees of the embassy are not uh, American citizens. They're nationals of the host country or of other countries who fill all of the positions that can be from the drivers and the maintenance staff to in fact a large number, whether in the consular section, management section, political, economic, or public affairs, 
there are employees who've been there working at the embassy many, many years with a lot of expertise, whether it's in dealing with the media, in managing immigrant visa cases, in doing economic or political analysis, or in managing the finance, budget, personnel sections of the management section. Your ability, and often early on in your career, you'll be managing uh, host country nationals who may have 20, 25 years of experience. Uh, as a senior manager, I watch very carefully to see how young officers manage those relationships. And that demonstrates real skill, the skill to be able to be a manager and be effective in getting the most out of that employee, but also in deferring to the expertise and experience that generally exceeds any expertise or experience that a young American officer might have. Mr. Ambassador, quick question on your background before the service. Would you have, do you think getting your master's was a good idea before the service, or would you have changed that and done that as part of the, the service's master's programs? Um, I think that you would find that most Foreign Service officers entering uh, orientation classes have advanced degrees or have significant uh, experience in another career before entering the Foreign Service. I do see a difference in officers who enter the Foreign Service directly out of college, whether it's they lack some of the experience, the background, but having some additional work experience or academic experience I think is very, very important to get a good solid start in the Foreign Service. We have thousands and thousands of students uh, across the country lined up in Arabic. Um, and, uh, and I'd be interested to, to, to hear what kinds of recommendations you might have for helping those students s stand out as far as their uh, experience goes. Obviously, uh, the better they are at it, the more, the more that they, the more rarefied the air gets. Uh, but also other, other languages uh, that, that you might see. Uh, we've heard, uh, yeah, love to hear your recommendations for you know, looking at looking to the future and saying, you know, this isn't all just this isn't just about Arabic. We're 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 looking at all of the languages in the Middle East, and could, certainly would love to have recommendations beyond the anything you would is looking forward. Well, I think uh, having the language uh, in any country always is going to make you feel more comfortable, make you enjoy the experience more. When I see people sometimes who are attempting to adjust to a new culture, a new environment without the language, uh, that. Um, understand can be very, very difficult. You feel sort of at loss sometimes. Uh, when you move about the world often, you become very, very familiar with sort of the rhythms of culture shock, and what happens and sort of what you can expect as you move to a new place. You know, your first month you'll experience this, your first six months you'll go through this certain set of experiences before you really begin to feel comfortable and feel that you can uh, be effective and enjoy the place. Uh, frankly, in a job like the Foreign Service that requires that you move from place to place, it's just not worth it if you're going to be miserable in that place, if you're not going to feel that you enjoy the culture, enjoy meeting the people, enjoy interacting with them. If you uh, are only interested in uh, uh, going from home to office and locking yourself up and uh, uh, keeping yourself from experiencing the country good and bad, you probably are in the wrong line of work. So language is critical to, I think, any experience of, uh, of living overseas, particularly if you intend to do that on a sustained basis. Any thoughts on opportunity languages uh, you see on the, on the horizon if you, were a, if you were an undergraduate now, you know, say a freshman, college, or high school student, uh, and you would be thinking, oh, yeah, you know, I see huge opportunity. Well, uh, I, I think the Foreign Service would uh, identify Arabic as one of the critical languages. Chinese, of course, is always a language in, uh, in great demand. Uh, the uh, languages in the Middle East, of course, uh, uh, Kurdish is a, a, a language that the Foreign Service has a hard time finding people that have background and expertise. Farsi, Urdu, some of those languages are related, so if you train somebody in Farsi, you can quickly uh, train them, uh, bring them up to proficiency in Urdu. Uh, but Arabic, um, my experience in serving in a number of embassies is probably only in about 60 to 70 percent of the positions that are language designated. In other words, that the Foreign Service has said you must have the language in order to fill this position. Many of those positions are filled by officers who are not proficient in the language simply because there's a shortage of officers with the language capability. And uh, an embassy suffers as a result. Any thoughts on why we're not um Getting the people to the to the to the levels that are that are should they should have. Well, um, it's largely a resource issue. Um, 
you have to be able to take somebody out of a normal career uh, assignment for two years in order to gain proficiency in a language like Arabic. If you have people that you recruit and bring in who already have the language, of course, then that uh, is, is a great plus. But at the end of the day, even when you have people who are language proficient, for family reasons, career reasons, they're not always going to be willing or available to fill language designated positions. So if you're in a position uh, where as perhaps the deputy chief of mission uh, of a large embassy in the region, you're looking and you're having to make choices. Will we accept this officer to fill this position even though he or she does not have the language? They have another skill set and they're an outstanding officer, but can we make that compromise? And, and those are difficult choices to make, but uh, the manager of an embassy has to make those decisions uh, uh, again and again and again. How, how about Turkish? You, you, you haven't mentioned Turkish in, in, in Central. We think of Turkish and Turkic languages and, and uh, sorts of uh, any, any thoughts on as an as a opportunity language? Um, Turkey is uh, a language that uh, is uh, much easier to train somebody into proficiency. It's not one of the hard languages that requires a full two years to, uh, to gain proficiency in. So again, because of the queuing effect of having a shorter period of time in which you can train somebody. Generally, if you have a language that you can train somebody to be proficient in within one year, it's fairly easy to recruit people to go into language training. Language training always you know, entails some sacrifices for an officer who's willing to, um, to go into that. Uh, it's a fairly large commitment to ask somebody to say, you know, take two years out of your career, your family, and everything else now to go into doing nothing but language training. So um, those languages that require the two years, even uh, two years of Arabic, however, most officers come out of that with a basic level of proficiency. We now offer the opportunity to some officers to do an additional year after they've served one or two assignments in the region to gain a higher level of proficiency because we recognize that we need officers who are able to go in front of um, uh, TV cameras on interviews, on talk shows, to be able to really deal with the public in a way that a basic level of proficiency does not give you. And um, I could probably count on uh, the fingers of both hands the number of officers I know who have that level of proficiency in Arabic, who can really be effective perhaps going on to Al Jazeera, a satellite channel, and explaining or defending a U.S. position.